Okay, hello everybody and uh, welcome to another fine webcast organized by the European Legal Tech Association. Uh, today we have Eric Chin, you see him uh, online, of Melbourne, uh, Australia, as I always seen present presenter. Uh, Eric is a consultant uh, to Legal Tech, New Law, Big Law and Big Four, uh, firms on strategy, M&A and the uh, Asian markets uh, in general. And a huge tip to the head uh, to Eric for getting up so early. Uh, as I understand, it's 5 a.m. in Melbourne, so pretty early for, for him. So today, Eric will talk about uh, the research uh, into the global legal tech market uh, he did using the uh, Codex Tech Index. Uh, that's uh, the first part of his presentation, and the second part will be uh, he will shed some light on uh, the specific markets in the South uh, East uh, Asian, uh, uh, South East Asia, the Asian uh, countries. Uh, a very dynamic uh, region, so that's uh, his uh, second second part of his presentation. So as always, uh, the webcast will be recorded and uh, will be put on the other YouTube channel tomorrow. So now over to you, Eric. Oh, thank you, Holger. Um, I just want to make sure you can hear me okay at the moment. Yes, I, I can hear you, and I guess. So uh, yeah. thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, it's. Uh, 5 a.m. here, but my body clock, as I've mentioned earlier, is still on Singapore and Malaysian time, which means it's sort of 2 a.m. for me. Um, it's just like a late night out, really. <laughs> um, so I'll do this session in two halves. Uh, the first half being an exploration of the legal tech ecosystem through this Codex Tech Index, and the second half being uh, a snapshot of what's happening in the legal tech market across Southeast Asia. And I'll share why I'm sharing that uh, later in the session. So. Uh, let's kick this off. Uh, just a quick background about me to help you contextualize how I see the market. Uh, as Hoger has mentioned, um, I am a strategy consultant that has worked in the legal profession uh, for the last nine years. Uh, the work that I do in this space are with law firms, legal tech firms, listed law firms, buyers of legal services on strategy, M&A, Asia competitive analysis and market analysis. Um, and the dots on the wall map are essentially where the clients I've worked with are based, and I'm based in Melbourne. Um, and I also share thought leadership papers uh, and reports with legal media and legal publication. So just a quick background about the first half of this paper. Um, it's a combination of research I've done into Stanford Law's Codex Tech Index. Um, so Sanford Law's Codex program is essentially the Center for Legal Informatics that is run out of Sanford Law School. And in February this year, I analyzed the Codex Tech Index uh, when there were 790 on the list um, and cross-referenced those entries with Crunchbase and Index.co. And the question I wanted to answer was firstly, who are those legal tech firms? Secondly, where are they based? Thirdly, what corporate activity could I find uh, from a funding and M&A perspective? Fourthly, who are in the, investing in legal tech? And fifth and finally, which segments of the legal tech market has attracted the most money and seen the most corporate activity? So what came out of that process um, was basically 1,768 lines of data on Excel, essentially exploring the global legal tech ecosystem. And I'm very happy to share a snapshot of this report with you today. Um, a lot of what I do in the market is to quantify what is very qualitative. So this is a, 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 the type of work that I do. Um, and just to put the global legal tech market into context, um, we need to first understand the global legal services industry. It's a $612 billion market that is projected to grow to $705 billion by the end of this decade. And from the Australian perspective from this, our industry is a $21 billion market or about 3.3% of the global legal services industry. And so what about the legal tech market? I think let's first define what, what are legal tech firms. So here's my definition of what legal tech firms are. They're essentially businesses that use technology arbitrage at the center of their business model in the delivery of legal services. And let me contrast my definition of a law firm business model against a legal tech firm business model. So if you look at the history of the legal industry, the first manifestation for the need for legal services actually came in the form of law firms. 
So for many years, when an organization had a legal need, it essentially had two choices. First, you tend to their corporate legal departments, and then when expertise were required, they tend to law firms. And therefore, law firms Hello. Yep. Oh, so you will, you lost okay. you probably. Okay. So All right. I, I thought it was you be lost. Yeah. You. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No right, problem. Where did, yep. Where did you lose me yet? Uber? Yeah. Go ahead. I I okay. can hear. You. I assume the the other ones will 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 hear you as well. We can hear you as well. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Yeah, we can hear Excellent. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. So I'm just wondering where, where did you lose me before I, I went um, offline? On, uh, on exactly on that at, on on that uh, very slide. Ah, uh, right. Uh, you, you you were talking about uh, your your uh, the, the difference between your definition and some other definition, and then and you you went black. So okay. All right. Cool. Um, okay. So so basically, I wanted to contrast my definition of what a, a law firm business model is versus a legal tech firm business model. Um, so the, I mean, if you look at the history of the legal industry, the first manifestation for the need for legal services actually came in the form of law firms. And for many years, when an organization had a legal need, essentially had two choices. First, they turned to their corporate legal departments. And then when expertise were required, they turned to law firms. And law firms have built a really successful business model around expertise arbitrage for corporate legal departments. And when you think about it, the law firm business model is about recruiting, training, hiring, and then billing based on expertise provided to corporate legal departments. Now, it is not until the turn of the millennium when the industry was engulfed by both outsourcing and technological trends that new solutions we can see. So the outsourcing trend gave birth to what we call new law firms, which are essentially labor arbitrage business models. And then a technological trend gave birth to legal tech firms. So what's the size of the legal tech market? Um, oops, let me see. Now, the legal tech market is estimated by Catalyst, which is a private equity firm out of the US that also invests in legal tech companies to be a $15.9 billion market that is selling solutions to both corporate legal departments and law firms. And that's a really important point a lot of what we read in the media, as you know today, uh, is about the threat of technologies and how robo lawyers are going to replace lawyers. And that is not in the case in, in reality. Like any functioning market, businesses are set up to solve a problem. And at the moment, legal tech firms are conceived to improve lawyer efficiency and lawyer effectiveness. So a lot of the media attention towards sensationalizing some of the things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis really drive a lot of the fear within the legal community as well. And when you take a step back and look at the legal tech ecosystem, it's actually driven by eight categories uh, of stakeholders. You have firstly law firms who are consumers of legal tech solutions, or they could partner with 
legal tech firms to conceive new solutions for the market. Or thirdly, for some of the law firms out there, they have the resources to build their own legal tech solutions. Then you have legal tech firms who are the ones that build and sell those legal tech solutions. A third category are essentially buyers of legal services that comes in the form of corporate legal departments who are also consumers of legal tech solutions. And then there are law schools and law associations basically representing the end-to-end -end journey of uh, a lawyer's education life cycle from graduates to um, continuous education with law associations. And then we have technologies who then set the scene uh, for the consumption of technology, technology in the legal industry. We have also investors who then invest in legal tech companies. And finally, regulators that set the scene uh, for the legal tech ecosystem, whether it is an, a hospitable legal tech ecosystem or an inhospitable legal, legal tech ecosystem. Um, each of those stakeholders play an important role in driving the legal tech ecosystem. Take, for example, the role of legal tech firms. Um, in Australia, for instance, early this year, a group of legal tech firms actually came together uh, to form the Australian Legal Technology Association. And what that meant was to pull together all the legal tech firms across Australia to come together and basically share some of the common issues they face in, in selling their solutions to the legal industry. And as we know in the legal market, it, the sales cycle is a lot longer. It's not your usual sort of tech company environment as well. Um, and um, now in, in 2015, uh, Stanford Law launched the Codex Tech Index, uh, which is a crowdsourced database of the world's legal tech firms. And what they've done for us is basically categorized the legal tech population in nine categories. Uh, we have legal practice management solutions, legal document automation, e-discovery, legal analytics, all the way through to legal research, compliance, and education. And here's how the Codex Tech Index work. Self-identified legal tech firms will firstly apply to get on the list. Secondly, Stanford Law's Codex team will then review each applicant against a set of criteria. And once the applicant has been approved, you then get on the tech index. In other words, it's a crowdsourced database. So in February this year, there were 790 on the database. But if you go back to the website today, there are more than 1,000 on the list. Uh, so it's a continuously growing database that is crowdsourced. So after going through my analysis uh, of the 790, cross-referencing all of that with Crunchbase and Index of Co, I ended up with 692 verified legal tech firms. And the reason I've called the list down from 790 to 692 is firstly because there's quite a few double entry on the tech index. Secondly, law, firm, law firms were also removed from my analysis because they're not legal tech firms. Uh, thirdly, incubation farms uh, that got on the list were also removed. Um, and here's a breakdown of that 692 legal tech firms by segment. In other words, what we're seeing really is the segment that has the largest population globally through the Stanford Law Codex Tech Index are legal document automation, legal marketplace, and legal practice management. And to contrast that, the segment of the legal tech market that has the sm smallest population is legal compliance, interestingly. So what I was able to do as well is to trace the year founded of those legal tech firms on the tech index. Uh, it may come as a surprise to you, certainly did for me, but the first legal tech firm was actually founded in 1929. And that was Bloomberg BNA's predecessor company, the Bureau of National Affairs. And when you look at this chart, what it's really telling me is that 2010 marked the tipping point of legal tech startup as more and more legal tech firms were founded. And the reason I say 2010 was the legal tech tipping point uh, is because 84% of Codex legal tech firms were established from 2010 onwards. So then the, the next question is, which countries are pumping out these legal tech firms? Here's a breakdown of the legal tech firms by country. 
Um, unsurprisingly, the U.S. is home to the most number of legal tech firms, 460, followed by Canada with 52, the U.K. with 35, Germany with 15, and of course, to run out the top five, Australia with 13. And you can see a huge cluster across Europe um, as well that is covered by the tech index. Um, and of course, Holger, you and I have had this conversation about how the tech index is quite American centric. Yep. Therefore, the data that you see uh, doesn't quite paint um, the, the, the full picture necessarily for each of the countries you're looking at. For instance, in Russia, I think you've mentioned to me before, um, there are probably close to 50 or 60 Russian legal tech firms that are in existence today. Uh, whereas my yep. research, the, the Australian market, uh, I found 93 illegal tech firms as an example, right? Uh, but it's a really good indication of, of sort of, I guess, if you want to have an overview of what's happening, the tech index is a really good place to start. Um, yeah, so here's the geographic breakdown of those legal tech firms in the first instance. Um, let's look for what other data I was able to uncover in this research. So thanks to Crunchbase and Index of Co, I was able to trace the type of funding deals reported by those legal tech firms uh, from angel investment in the early stage uh, through to venture capital in the growth stage and then finally M&A in a mature stage of a startup company's typical financing life cycle. And through this exercise, I was able to trace about $2.5 billion that were invested into 200 legal tech firms through 419 funding deals. So these are all funding deals for Stanford Law's Codex Tech Index firms. And the cutoff point for this analysis was February, end of February 2018, which is February this year. And what this is showing is by far the segment that has received the most amount of funding were legal practice management, legal document automation, and e-discovery. Whereas the segments that have received the least amount of funding were legal, com legal compliance and legal education, which is quite interesting. I think uh, from from a sort of my perspective, looking at the legal tech markets, um, I see massive opportunity in the compliance space. Uh, and the reason I say that is, if you look at the Australian market as an example, uh, there was a study that was conducted by Deloitte, uh, which looked at the cost of compliance to the Australian economy. Um, Hoga, I, I mean, in, earlier I shared that, you know, the, the Australian legal market is about $21 billion. <laughs> yep. Whereas the cost of compliance to the Australian economy um, is 10 times that. So it's $200 billion annually. Um, so there's a massive opportunity in compliance, but we haven't quite seen a lot of people coming out in that space. Having said that, the compliance space sort of sits a little bit as well with the reg tech uh, segment of the market. Yeah, uh, yeah. so that, that's a pretty interesting to me uh, segment to look at for the future. Um, but let's dive into uh, the other sort of data points I was able to find on financing to legal tech firms. So here's a yearly breakdown of that $2.5 billion uh, that were raised by legal tech firms on the Codex Tech Index. What we see here is the funding deals actually peaked in 2015 with $624 million. And then the number of funding deals picked the year before with 76 in 2014. So let's have a look at which are the, those legal tech firms that have raised the most amount of money. By, by far, from my analysis, uh, DocuSign has raised the most with $515 million before they IPO'd uh, early this year uh, in April on NASDAQ. And then you have LegalZoom with $311 million. Of course, they've gone through a refinancing recently and AVO with $132 million around the top three. And the rest sort of just straddles around. Uh, from 125 million to about 26 million dollars. So there's quite quite a lot of um, big funding deals that have been recorded by some of those legal tech firms, as you can see. What I was able to do as well is to trace the the amount of funding for those firms uh, in each funding round, and here's a 
uh, breakdown of the top 20 largest funding deals raised in a single round. Um, unsurprisingly, DocuSign has raised the most in a single funding round uh, with $233 million, followed by LegalZoom with $200 million, and then relatively previously Kekura uh, with $125 million. And most of that has come from uh, the VC round, uh, unsurprisingly, as well. And so because this chart is showing the, the largest funding deal per round, um, that's why you see DocuSign appearing a few times on this chart. So they've raised a lot of money per round is what we're seeing. Same with LegalZoom as well. Now, what I was able to do uh, with this analysis is also to look at the funds raised in each round against on the horizontal axis, years between foundation of that legal tech startup with your funding rounds. Let, let me explain this. So take, for example, um, DocuSign with $233 million right at the top. Um, so that $233 million was raised in 2015. And DocuSign was founded in 2003. So on the horizontal axis, uh, it's 12 years. So between years foundation and that funding round, um, on the vertical axis, axis is $233 million. And what I was able to find from this analysis is that average funding deals to legal tech firms actually occur close to three years after commencement. And that can probably be attributed to a few things. Firstly, those legal tech firms would have that have survived and thrived uh, would have built a track record for potential investors to gauge their viability as an investment. Secondly, as most successful startups would, uh, they would have updated and improved on the minimum viable product at launch, incorporating now feedback from the market. So let's have a look at uh, which funding rounds have legal tech firms turned to most to raise money. Uh, uh, here's a breakdown of funding data by funding rounds. Um, interestingly and unsurprisingly, most of the funding deals actually occurred during, during the venture capital round with about $1.8 billion raised by uh, firms through 152 funding deals. And then the most number of funding deals actually occurs, uh, again, unsurprisingly, at the seed funding round with 172 funding deals. But of course, the amount raised at the seed funding round is a lot smaller, about 10 times that of what you see on the venture capital round, $152 million. And the rest of the analysis shows how much were, were raised through grants, angel investors, convertible note, non-equity assistance, so on and so forth. So in following the money, here's a geographic breakdown of where legal tech firms have raised funds. Unsurprisingly, most have been raised in the US with $2.1 billion, followed by the UK with $249 million, Australia with $36 million, Canada with $34 million, and then to round out the top five, Germany with $24 million. And this actually matched somewhat with the population of the legal tech firms in those countries. If you remember from my previous uh, breakdown of legal tech firms on the world map, uh, the top five countries with the most number of legal tech population were actually the US, Canada, UK, Germany, and Australia. So that's that's my, my research on uh, funding to legal tech firms. Let's have a look at who are those investors putting money into legal tech companies. Uh, through this research, I was able to trace 436 investors uh, funding the $2.5 billion to legal tech firms globally. And what I've done is I've met the legal tech investors on firstly the total participation um, amount on the vertical axis and the number of funding deals they participated on on the horizontal axis. And there are quite a few familiar faces here. Y Combinator, um, Google Ventures, 500 Startups, Ignition Partners, 
Dell Technologies Capital, so on and so forth. Now, here's the top 20 legal tech investors that have invested in the most number of funding deals, represented by the blue bars. Uh, the biggest invested by a number of funding deals were actually Y Combinator, which participated in 13 funding deals, followed by Ignition Partners, which participated in 10, and Type for 3, uh, SV Angel and Finance Startups, both invested in eight funding deals. And here's the data on uh, the biggest losses by amount participated. So Iconic Capital participated in $358 million in funding deals, followed by Sense Capital Ventures with 318 and then Dell Technologies with $278 million. So this wraps up my, my snapshot of the investors that are actively participating in the legal tech markets. Um, what I was able to find as well from this research uh, is to trace the M&A deals recorded by those legal tech firms. And here, here are um, a breakdown of those M&A deals by segment. What I was able to do was to trace 111 M&A deals recorded um, by 44 legal tech firms on the Codex Tech Index. By far the most corporately active segment is in legal research. And this is however because of listed companies like Thomson Reuters and LexisNexis. Now here's a yearly breakdown of those M&A deals by segment. As you can see, consolidation in the legal research segment can be observed followed by legal practice management with 13 M&A deals and then document automation with 12 M&A deals. And here's the breakdown by those acquirers. As you can see, uh, with access to funding uh, in, in the form of these companies at like Thomson Reuters and LexisNexis, uh, you can now fund growth by acquisition. And finally, uh, here's a geographic breakdown of those 111 M&A deals recorded by those legal tech firms. Unsurprisingly, uh, most of that has been recorded in the US with 104, followed by the UK with only three, and then the rest in Netherlands, Italy, Spain, and Australia. Noting, of course, all of this data is only looking at the legal tech firms on Codex, and the cutoff point of this analysis was February this year as well. And so that is a snapshot of the global legal tech ecosystem through Sanford Law's Codex Tech Index. We, we first saw a breakdown of where those legal tech firms are based. Secondly, the $2.5 billion that were raised by those legal tech firms. And thirdly, um, consolidation that is happening in some segments of the market as well. Uh, what, what's really interesting for me looking at this chart is this is essentially a high-level overview of the global legal tech ecosystem. Any any thoughts, uh, Hoger, or observations? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it looks it looks uh, really like that uh, the money into legal tech is going after the money into the uh, the legal market itself. Because if you look at the largest uh, number of deals, number of investments, it's the US, the UK, uh, Germany, Australia. So the US market was by far the largest market. Uh, legal, legal, legal market, uh, legal services market, with half of the uh, global market, and the UK and Germany, as far as I understand, it's the uh, third largest. Uh, Australia, 21 million, you, you, you said, uh, a, a large market. So probably the money uh, so far is going uh, after the money in the legal legal services market. Looks like. Yeah, there is. It looks like there's somewhat of, of a correlation, doesn't it, um, between the size of the legal industry. And and the size of the funding deal towards those uh, legal tech firms. And it, it, to me, it also shows uh, the level of, I guess, uh, competition and maturity of those markets as well. 
um, for for the legal tech solutions to be able to um, you know market themselves as viable sort of uh, investment assets for uh, investors. Yeah. Um, and it also shows that uptake in those markets for legal tech solution is probably relatively higher in comparison to the other jurisdictions where we see fewer funding deals occurring as well, potentially. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, saw, I saw recently a, a statistic, uh, and of course, it's, it's hard to come by uh, with, with, with numbers. Uh, there's only very, very few uh, people are collecting data, analyzing it. So we, that's one of the reasons we, we, we organized a uh, webcast. Uh, in the first place, uh, that uh, you have a, you see a slightly shift from um, in investments from pre-seed and seed stages to uh, later stages A, B, C. So that looks like that investors, professional investors, are more more confident to invest in legal tech because if you at pre-seed or seed stage, it's more like a gamble. You just that's right put money. Uh, uh, a couple of hundred of, of, of a thousand of, of um, US dollars, euros. We'll see how see how it turns out. If I say it's yeah. A or, or, or B, it's 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 larger amounts, and you have to be more confident. So that's, um, in my opinion, a good trend to see that uh, the the industry is becoming more mature. But what's interesting is that the the largest investors or the mo with the most deals are the the. Uh, uh, basically, publishing companies or legal research companies, Thomson Reuters and, and, and uh, LexisNexis, which is interesting. Of course, it's it's it, it seems uh, uh, just logic uh, logically that they invest money and then consolidate uh, partly the market. Uh, uh, but the, the the rest, you see a couple of investment companies with two or three deals and uh, quite quite huge amount. So it's. Um, looks looks like the legal tech companies can get investment. It's not not uh, out of out of order to, to, to uh, get investment. I think um, I think uh, if you if you look across the the legal tech market, I think um, to to add, to build on what you you mentioned about funding to legal tech firms, I, I see three big issues that legal tech firms are working through at the moment. The first issue being adoption and use. Um, selling to legal tech solutions in the legal market is, is quite tough uh, for, for most, if not, not some. Um, and you, if you look through any sort of legal media uh, outlets, you see a lot of firms, law firms, basically announcing that they have adopted this solution or that solution. But when you go deeper into you know, uh, the firm and ask the lawyers uh, whether they have used any of those legal tech solutions that have been marketed to the public, the answer is more likely than not, no, we haven't. Um, exactly. And you ask why, it's the answer you get back is because uh, we need to be seen as innovative, firstly, or our managing partner just like getting on the newspaper. Adoption <laughs> 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 and use is a massive issue that legal tech firms need to work on or are working through at the moment. And secondly, it's access to resources. Um, and by that, I mean, finding the right people to develop the product um, and, and secondly to sell the product because um, selling to lawyers is actually completely different to selling to uh, other sort of professions uh, because there's so many quirks uh, in the legal market that is not normal uh, in the context of uh, the, uh, the rest of the markets. Um, but thirdly, it's, it's, which is the point that you're raising, access to funding, um, because you need funds to help you with growing the business. Uh, those are the three key issues I see a lot in the work that I do with legal tech firms. Uh, and for some of the legal tech firms, uh, I've seen or have heard conversations around how if you talk to investors about legal tech solutions, the anchor that they use to understand the market is fintech. But of course, we know uh, that legal tech is not fintech, it's completely different, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because the addressable yeah. market is completely different. Some of it is quite jurisdictional driven as well because of the type of uh, legal regulatory environment you're in, but it's civil law, uh, common law, or so on and so forth. Uh, it's completely different. Um, but but yeah, that's, that's what I've seen. I wonder what you've seen, Holger, in your work as well in the space. Well, yeah. What, what, what was uh, a, a revelation 
for me is that uh, uh, compliance is, is uh, quite underfunded and under, underrepresented because that's a huge huge amount of legal work. So, so mitig mitigating risk is, is, is one of the uh, first solution or first, first um, task for, for any lawyer. So there should be more money, even if, even if you think that uh, part of those solutions are uh, combined under rec uh, regulatory uh, tech. But uh, nonetheless, pro probably uh, most of the companies starting in the field of legal tech are going for the low hanging fruit like uh, practice management and re legal research and put some AI on top of it and, 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 and let's try that because compliance is quite difficult from, from, from the uh, content point of view. So you have to, to have a very deep understanding on how compliance works and how, how to implement that in a, in a corporate setting. And uh, it's not, not, not trivial to, to find a solution. For, for, for those problems, but it's it's easier to have a CRM system or a case management system and so on. So probably that's part of the uh, the picture that they are, everybody's going for the low hanging fruit like uh, fruit like document assembly. You see them popping up uh, in in almost every every uh, country. Uh, yep. There's a lot of solutions with the document assembly, but uh, as you showed, uh, very 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 uh, few in in, in um, compliance, which should be That's, more. So, so yeah, it's, the, the, it's 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 an um, uh, opportunity if somebody wants to go into uh, legal tech. Uh, probably, I would not advise to do the the the, the 15th, uh, document assembly tool, but go into compliance. So. Yeah, because because um, it, it looks like that's where the blue ocean is, where there isn't as much concentration of uh, players in that segment of the market. I absolutely agree with you. Um, and, 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 and also, if you look across different jurisdictions as well, you see different makeup of the legal tax segment. For instance, in, in Australia, by far the biggest segment uh, in the legal tech market are really firstly document automation, unsurprisingly. Secondly, legal ops, which is a massive exploding market at the moment because it's a massive yeah. opportunity to help corporate legal departments with improving their efficiency. Uh, they need to solve their workflow issue. They need to solve their prioritization issue, so on and so forth. So, so legal ops is the second largest segment in Australia. And the third largest segment is really the legal marketplace uh, companies, where there's a lot as well here where uh, we're essentially connecting you know, buyers and bu and users of legal services with um, yeah. voice on demand, essentially. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's interesting because is it because uh, it's it's a large country and uh, comparatively um, uh, uh, low population or, or lack of infrastructure to 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 to, to get uh, to legal services on a, on a uh, uh, traditional way. Because um, I I always thought that the Australian market is quite quite developed and and uh, it's not yeah. not a huge issue for for somebody looking for legal services um, to, to, to find a lawyer in Australia. I, it, it's easy. Um, the thing is because the market is just mature enough uh, in the way consumers are consuming um, online and therefore they are more comfortable with buying professional services online at this stage. Um, and what that means people are increasingly going online to buy legal services as well. Okay, so and, and, and I guess the market is not so uh, strictly regulated then, then if, if, if uh, alternative uh, services can pop up and, and, and deliver legal services, or do you have to be, uh, like say in Germany, you have to be uh, a, a lawyer to in order to, to, to offer legal consultation uh, to, to, to a specific person, or more generally, it's a, if it's a legal advice to everybody, then you can do that. But if you if it's a specific advice to a specific person, you you have to be a lawyer uh, in Germany. Yeah. Is is it the same in Australia? Yeah, absolutely the same as well. But but what's been pretty interesting in the last sort of twelve months is the to me anyway is the the rise of the chatbots. Um, to some, you know, it, it's actually just providing legal in, information. But to others, it's sort of, well, you're kind of crossing the line to legal advice because people might just use a chatbot as a tool to lead to advice, right? So yeah. 
if you look at any of the regulators across Australia, some of them are actually looking into this. You know, wh where does the line cross to advice from information? Because mm -hmm. um, people could act on act on it. Like, it's not a given that you know, once you sort of Google, you know, your symptoms on on Doctor Google or whatever, uh, that you don't then action on take action on it, right? Um, yeah. But but it's a it's a really in, interesting development from my perspective. Looking at it, um, don't know if that's what you're seeing as well across Europe. Yeah, absolutely. Look, people are well. It, it's the misconception of, of most of the lawyers that people are looking for a lawyer, but people are looking for a solution to their legal problems. And if it's a chatbot uh, who can 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 make that problem go away, then they will use that. Mm. So they're not looking for a lawyer. That's the point. Some kind of misconception on the part of the lawyers. Okay, well, I guess we, we have also processed that information. It was quite a lot of what you did with, with that information. And uh, thank you very much for that part. Uh, and I guess there will be questions of people at the end or, or what's uh, uh, directed to you because, uh, well, it's, 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 it's at least you, you get a glimpse on the market and uh, see some dynamics. It's yeah. very interesting. So maybe yep. now we can switch to uh, a specific market, the uh, Asian market or uh, okay. Southeast Asia. Uh, yeah. So you have a quite uh, a, a, so dif different players in, in that market. The local economies of those countries are quite different from each yes. other. So you have powerhouses like Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia on one hand and uh, developing economies like Laos or Myanmar, uh, where I can't imagine there are a lot of law firms or legal service uh, offerings, uh, how different are those uh, legal markets or their legal tech startups in, in every a a Asian country? Maybe you can. Oh, yeah, it's, it's completely different. I think, um, so So this chart um, really sets the scene for the ASEAN Southeast Asian market, which I'll go into. Um, because when you look at all the different narrative about what's happening in the global legal tech ecosystem or the legal tech market, a lot of that conversation has been uh, about what's happening in developed Western countries, uh, like the US, yeah. Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and so on and so forth. But from this, the Asian market, as an example, I do see quite a bit of activity. They don't get as much, you know, media attention, um, or they don't come as much in the global conversation around what are some of the legal tech solutions out there. Um, so, as part of my way to shed a light on this segment of the markets, um, I will be sharing with you um, this the ASEAN legal tech market, a snapshot of it. And I'll okay. end with sort of why sharing a snapshot of the ASEAN legal tech market. So ASEAN actually stands for South uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Um, it is home to 630 million people with a combined GDP of 2.5 trillion. And it's actually 10 countries uh, in ASEAN. There's Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, the Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. Um, and when you look at the legal profession in this part of the world, here's what I found. There are about 155,000 lawyers servicing that 630 million population in this region. And what that means is really one lawyer for about 4,000 people. Uh, in other words, it is under lawyer and therefore this massive opportunity for legal tech solutions to help with access to justice. And that's the first thing that come to my mind when I look at those numbers. Um, and um, so secondly, this massive opportunity um, to, to help lawyers to be more efficient, right? Um, so here, here's a, a quick research. Um, and this is a collaboration that I've done with um, quite a few thought leaders and pioneers in the Southeast Asian market. So I just want to quickly give thanks to them. So there's Adeline, Adeline Chin uh, in Malaysia, Charlene Tan in Singapore, Daniel Liu in Malaysia, Ivan Rote in Singapore, Laurie Babb, Baldry Serrano in the Philippines, Melissa Lim in Malaysia, 
Melvin Simapong in Indonesia, Javan Dizon in Philippines, and Jenna Hui Ching in Malaysia, where they, they, through my work with them, I was able to trace 73 uh, legal tech firms in four countries. And I'm still in the process at the moment of trying to find pioneers and thought leaders in markets like Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Brunei to help me through with this research. But interestingly, if you look across the region, this, this comes back to your point earlier about how the legal tech market is probably a lot more mature in, in, in countries like Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. And just by looking at the population of the legal tech market in those countries alone, you can see pretty quickly that Singapore has uh, 23 legal tech firms, Malaysia with 20, Indonesia with 22, the Philippines with eight. Uh, note also that this is an ongoing research that, that I'm doing with the team. Um, what better way to do this than to get local guides to do it uh, with you uh, who actually understand the market because I, um, coming from Australia, will not be able to credibly say that I know the markets in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines inside out. Uh, yeah. And, and this is a continuous process that we're going through at the moment, collecting data on those legal tech firms. Um, and it's a growing database as well that, it, that we're working on. Um, so let us let me show you a quick snapshot of the four countries. Um, so here's a snapshot of Singapore's legal tech markets. There are 23 legal tech firms in Singapore, and by far the biggest segment is legal document automation followed by legal marketplace with three firms. And then the rest kind of sets, sits around uh, knowledge management, legal practice management solutions, legal research, and legal document review solutions, which is quite interesting. And again, you, you, see, you see the Malaysian landscape slightly different to the Singapore landscape. Um, for, for this research, I just want to point out again, thanks to Charlene Tan at Tesseract, and Ivan Rote at Peckley. Um, so let's look at the Indonesian market. Um, by far the biggest segments in the Indonesian market are legal marketplace, legal document automation, and legal research with five and five and five uh, in terms of a breakdown of number of legal tech firms. And then the rest kind of sits around IP tech, uh, online legal service, compliance analytics, and practice management. Uh, this is research that was conducted by Melvin Simapong at Justica, which is a legal tech firm as well in Indonesia. Then we have the Malaysian legal tech market, where by far the biggest segment is the legal research segment with seven legal tech firms, followed by legal practice management with six. And then the rest kind of in legal marketplace, legal education, so on and so forth. And this is a research um, done in collaboration with Adeline Chin, Daniel Lui, Jenna, Jenna Hui Ching, Melissa Lim from Law Tech Malaysia, which is a relatively new organization that's looking to work with the Malaysian market to educate them about um, the, this, the fact that legal tech solutions are not here to replace lawyers because there's a lot of fear within the legal community in Malaysia about how their jobs could be at risk um, or that they might get automated away from, from the legal industry, which comes back to my earlier point um, about how the sensationalization that uh, legal media publications um, have done in terms of building the, the tension and momentum for legal type market has been great to, to a certain extent, but at the same time, it's a double-edged sword in that when you're faced with conservative law association and law societies, um, they tend to take a more conservative approach towards legal tech. Uh, Malaysian to market to me is an example of that somewhat. Um, also, like to point out Jun Law uh, from Easy Law, which is a legal app uh, solution in the Malaysian market, which is unique on its own, uh, also contributed to this research as well. So we were able to find 20 legal tech firms in Malaysia And then here's a breakdown of the Philippines legal tech market. By far the biggest uh, legal document automation and, and then legal research with three and three. And then legal marketplace with two. 
again, this is an emerging market for legal tech solutions. Um, and it's an ongoing research uh, that was conducted by Jay Fund Dizon and Laurie Bev Baldry Serrano um, in collaboration with me. I, I would think that, uh, especially in the Philippines, uh, quite, quite a couple, uh, quite some legal tech companies would would uh, arise out of legal uh, uh, process outsourcing company because if if, if you look at uh, UK UK or uh, uh, US uh, law firms, uh, a lot of them are outsourcing the the bread and butter work to to either Bombay or Manila. So it's uh, interesting. It's, it's some nice. some of this place. Uh, went into legal legal tech to, to because they are already uh, automating their own operations in order to, to, to keep the price level. Yeah, so so that's the difference in definition defining the market. So I would categorize legal process outsourcing in the new law bucket, which is where it's a essentially a labor arbitrage business model, whereas the legal tech market is a technology arbitrage business model. So LPO are essentially where you outsource um, to a jurisdiction where the cost of labor is uh, lower, uh, but the quality of the, that cost of labor is still really high. Um, so, so to me, that's the, a, a different segment of the, the market that we're talking about. Yes, um, absolutely, absolutely. But I guess that um, if, if uh, in, in uh, Jurisdictions like the UK, the US, or, or uh, other European company uh, countries, uh, law firms will implement more technology, then uh, probably the LPO uh, market will shrink. So that might be uh -huh. might be an exit strategy for LPO providers in in, in India and, and 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 the Philippines to to go into legal technology and and keep those customers. Yeah, it, it's quite interesting that you mentioned that because I've seen some of the LPO companies actually transition, transitioning their offering uh, from just providing a labor arbitrage solution to also um, venturing into legal tech. So some of them are also doing consulting uh, to legal departments as well to help them with improving their efficiency. A lot of the time, once you get into a conversation around um, staffing issues, that opens the door to how do we help you become more efficient and once you get into a conversation about efficiency, there's quite a few sort of parcels of consulting work around, okay, we could remove some of your fixed costs um, of staffing, um, and we will just basically be your outsource um, legal department, if, if possible. And then, or let's tag along sort of some of the technology that we have seen legal departments using to become more efficient, or to help with triaging the, the work that comes comes through to the legal department from the rest of the business. So you see a bit of that happening with some of the LPO providers. So I, I find that in my work in this space, um, it's increasingly hard to just put um, companies into one bucket uh, because as they evolve their offering to the changing market, they are constantly sort of straddling along uh, two or three different segments of the market as well, which is quite interesting. Um, but, but yeah, point taken, absolutely. I mean, some of the LPO companies probably will be looking at um, how not to be replaced by technology, okay. right? Okay. Um, and, and so, so given that's the snapshot of the Southeast Asian legal tech market, albeit we're just looking at four countries as an example. And the reason yeah. I'm doing a lot of work in the Southeast Asian market is because um, I have been inspired by what I've seen with Europe, with what you guys are doing with European Legal Technology Association. So I've embarked on a journey of basically establishing an ASEAN Legal Technology Association. Um, okay. At this stage, where I am, <laughs> and that's why we're in conversation as well, Hoger, uh, is yep. I've my regional board, which consists of um, a legal tech founder, um, uh, two representatives from uh, two law firms in Southeast Asia, um, the CEO of a legal tech arm of a law firm, and also the GC of a technology company who has an Asia Pacific head on as my regional board and working closely with them at the moment. Um, to establish the technology ASEAN Legal Technology Association, 
And where I am right now is um, if you want to establish an ASEAN organization, because ASEAN is a political entity on its own, I need to find representatives from all 10 countries. So at the moment, I'm, I'm still looking for potential collaborators in Vietnam, Brunei, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar. So if you have any contacts or if your listeners have any contacts in those markets that they know who are interested in the legal tech uh, markets, feel free to reach out to me because I, I'm, I'm on the lookout for collaborators in those uh, countries at the moment. Um, and we're working closely towards launching this at some point next year. Uh, fingers crossed before um, June 2019. Um, and yeah, this is the first time I'm sharing this publicly. So, <laughs> sounds, sounds, yes, uh, sounds exciting. Good, good luck with that. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, because we have uh, a mostly European uh, uh, viewership uh, that somebody knows. Uh, a legal tech company in Brunei, uh, which would be very, very I, I would be interested as well because uh, it, it looks uh, like a very exotic country. Uh, yeah. But you never know, you never know. But you know what? what one one country I I, I think we, we we should all be looking at is Singapore because uh, recently Singapore put legal tech on, on on the government agenda to come. As far as I understood, Singapore's. Uh, aiming to become uh, not only a financial powerhouse in the world, a global financial hub, so to say, in trade hub, but also in in the legal tech uh, sphere. So, uh, can you shed some light what's what's going on in Singapore? And because it's a small country, a very well organized country, and a rich country, and um, so I guess we should all uh, be be attentive and, and look what is going on in Singapore. Uh, and see what 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 uh, how how we can use uh, uh, their their efforts in, in into becoming a legal tech powerhouse. Absolutely. Uh, so so a market like Singapore, it, it's actually similar to most countries across Southeast Asia in that if it's driven, it, most of it is driven top down. So the Singapore government is really efficient. Uh, what they have done is they have developed a vision for. Singapore legal tech ecosystem and their goal is to essentially build Singapore as the Asia hub for legal tech and what that means is they're implementing programs to two major arms um, that are market facing so Singapore Law Society um, last year launched a rebate program called Tech Start for Law and what that is is essentially to, in to at least introduce law firms uh, to legal practice management solutions. So if you're a law firm um, and you haven't used legal tech solutions before, you can apply for the rebate program and essentially get 70%, I think, from memory, 70% of the first year's subscription to that legal tech solution. What that meant was it was an explosion of um, adoption across the board in 2017, and the rebate program was obviously oversubscribed which is a great thing because what that means is um, law firms are now exposed to those legal tech solutions. And in a market like Singapore, uh, essentially what you're looking at is about 95 or 98 percent of the law firm population are made up of law firms with um, one to five partners. So they're really small. Um, Obviously, you have the big end of town, uh, like Raja and Tan, Wong Partnership, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but it's still a, a long tail as well. And what that means is for um, the law society that they need to help that long tail who don't necessarily have the resources like some of the bigger firms do in looking into the different technology solution and then implementing them. So the rebate program was a really good start to it. And what I'm hearing as well in the market on the ground is they're looking to launch a second Tech Start for Law program, uh, which will be announced at some point next year. Um, secondly, they're working through also an arm called Singapore Academy of Law. And last year they launched, or the, earlier this year actually, they launched FLIP, which stands for Future Law Innovation Program. So FLIP is an industry-wide education um, um, that is 
helping law firms and corporate legal departments in Singapore understand the legal tech ecosystem. And the programs are here to help law firms and legal departments in thinking about innovation in legal services as well. So you can enroll into a program where you get brought into um, a deeper dive into you know how where to start if you're looking at innovating your firm or adopting a technology for your legal department or law firm. Um, and, and yeah, they've been really successful. Um, so again, it's because the government has put in place programs. Um, we're seeing Singapore's maturity increasing rapidly uh, in the Southeast Asian market and also actually in the Asia Pacific market as well. Um, and that's why they, they are on a lot of market observers radar at the moment. But, but yeah, that's, that's Singapore. Very interesting. So I guess well, everybody should should send a link uh, to the to to that specific segment to 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 his uh, own government because I think that it's a very good idea to for the government to 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 um, yeah. organize some kind of rebate program for 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 law firms in order to get them uh, adopting legal tech because it's it's an investment especially for small and medium. Uh, law firms and and you never know whether that investment will pay out and if you have a basically no risk uh, um, uh, possibility to, to 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 look into legal technology that should be a huge boost um, to to law firms implementing legal technology so that's a very good idea I guess mm -hmm. so let's 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 see if we could replicate it in some European countries I'm not sure but. Uh, the, the idea is very spot on. Okay, right. Eric. Uh, so I don't see any any questions uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, so I guess then we will keep it at this uh, one hour. Wait a second. Cool. I will. And thank you very much for being with us today and uh, share your your expertise and share your your information on the global market and on. A very specific uh, Asian market, and I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Eric. No, likewise. Thank, thank you very you. much. Likewise. Thank you very much, Eric, as well. This is Julia again. There are no questions at the moment via chat, so I think you explained everything very well. I guess people people will reach out to Eric, uh, especially if they see <laughs> it, uh, because it, there's a huge amount of information you have to process that, and then. And I, I'm sure people will come up with questions and, and proposals, especially uh, with your idea of, of establishing a regional uh, legal tech association. It sounds very good, and I guess Alta will uh, keep an eye on you. Oh, absolutely. I'd love to continue our conversation as well. Um, love to see if I could extract some more learning from your journey of setting up Alta. Um, so that you know you have been through all the pain of setting it up, and if I could sort of short circuit my, my learning curve, that would be great. Um, and also for the audience, if you do reach out to me on social media, on LinkedIn. It's breaking up, I will switch off my camera. Yeah. Maybe Eric, you have to... Um, Stop your camera as well. Uh, Eric, you're, you're well. breaking. So, you're breaking. Um, just reach out to me at any point. Okay. Yeah, you you just broke up a little bit. You couldn't hear you, but, but no, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Once again, thank you very much, Eric, and so uh, maybe uh -huh. we can catch some some sleep. Sorry for 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 mm -hmm. doing that at that ungodly hour in the morning. <laughs> Well, it's actually just in time for me to start my day right now at 6 a.m. So, <laughs> okay, then let's let's do it on a weekly basis. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and thank you for thank everybody you. listening in, and thank you, Julia, for organizing it as always perfectly. Sure. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Have a lovely Bye. evening. Bye.